All right, we're, we're in uh, chapter 17 of the book of Acts. This is a very famous uh, portion of the book of Acts. This is Paul on Mars Hill. This is where Paul had the opportunity to witness in Athens to all these Greeks, Greek intellects. And they, uh, they're, they're brilliant people, people like... Uh, Aristotle and Socrates and Plato and Aristophanes and names that are probably familiar. I mean, they, go, they predate Paul the Apostle by centuries, all those names. However, the Greeks were uh, great thinkers, great writers, and uh, consequently, uh, they loved to sit around and philosophize. And Paul the Apostle was not short on philosophizing. If you want to philosophize, I've got a Bible, and we'll sit down and we'll talk philosophy. We sure will. Philosophy just sim simply means this, lover of wisdom. And the greatest wisdom in all the universe is the wisdom of God. So you want to be a pure philosopher? Love the wisdom of God. So we're in Acts chapter 17. I'm on page 213 in our notes. And let's look at the introduction. In presenting the gospel to others, Christians must strive to be versatile. One size does not fit all, if I can use that. People are complex, and all the, although the final and sufficient answer to the needs of man is found in a relationship with Jesus Christ, it really is simple once you understand it. All people do not face the same obstacles. They don't face the same questions in coming to Christ. The book of Acts vividly illustrates this in the many and varied presentations of the gospel. We've seen many already. Peter's message on Pentecost does not resemble in any way, shape, or form that which we're reading here, Paul's message in Acts chapter 17. To the Athenian philosophers on Mars Hill, evangelism isn't, as I said, a one-size-fit-all discipline. Evangelists must be equipped to help seekers navigate the questions and obstacles to faith that uniquely characterize each individual. The Pharisees of Christ's day desperately needed a different approach than the elite thinkers of the Areopagus or of Mars Hill. They needed a different approach. Peter writes, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts in, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. That's a commandment in Scripture. We are commanded to be knowledgeable enough in Scriptures, in the Scriptures, so that when people would approach us and ask us questions about our faith, why we believe what we believe, that we could and would respond intelligently, biblically, to those questions. It's not just what we believe that is important, although that is very important. What is also important is why we believe it. We need to have answers not just to the questions of who, what, etc., etc., but we need to answer the question, why? Why do you believe that to be true? And just simply saying, well, because the Bible says so, uh, that's a valid answer, but it's a very superficial answer for most people. Most people will say something like, well, I don't believe the Bible. And so that's the end of the discussion, if that's all you have to say. You need to learn how to deal with many different kinds of people and how to carry on a conversation with them. Um, I carry on conversations every week with people who are unbelievers. Some of them get involved. Some of them are very superficial because that's all that person can really take. I'm trying to maybe stimulate them to think about something they've never thought about before. And that's, all, that's as far as you can get with some people. Other people are much more well-schooled in theological or religious things, and you can carry on a pretty good conversation, a half-hour conversation with people about the Bible, about spirituality, about God, or about not believing in God. Well, anyway, 
Let's pick, pick things up here. In verse 16 of the 17th chapter of the book of Acts. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him and some said, what will this babbler say? Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? That's a good question. I was at a lunch appointment even yesterday with an individual, a couple individuals that I hadn't seen in years, and they asked me how I got to where I am as a pastor and as a minister. Well, they opened the door, double, double doors wide open, so I started and I gave them my testimony. Now, I didn't drag it out because I knew they'd get impatient with me, but I hit the major points of how I came to trust Christ as Savior and really what was important for anybody to trust Christ as Savior. Anyway, let's go back. What will this babbler say? And they took him, verse 19, and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine, what, what, it, what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians, notice the parentheses, and strangers, Luke writing here, all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. They like to jibber-jabber. They like to talk about these things and, you know, question one another. And it's okay. That was their, their dealie. They probably uh, fancied themselves as the most intelligent people on the face of the earth, I suppose. So Paul leaves Berea in advance of a contingency of unhappy Thessalonian Jews. His next stop is Athens, where he intends to wait for his companions to catch up. While he's waiting for them, he can't help but observe the idolatry of the city. And it really troubled him. I mean, he was in the capital of idolatry, of intellectual idolatry um, when he was in Athens. And, I mean, they had um, ro the Roman and Greek gods. They covered everything. There was a god for everything. So he's getting his eyes filled with this. Not that he didn't know that in the past. Probably knew a lot about it. But now he's getting a full double dose of it. Verse 17 tells us he found various groups of individuals to speak with. So he disputed in the synagogue with Jews and with devout persons and in the market daily with them that met him. Athens was the capital of the ancient philosophical and intellectual world. I've given you some names earlier that were very famous, still famous today, commonly referenced by the elite and by the educated in intelligentsia. In fact, if you were to take a philosophy class or course, a basic 101 philosophy class, you're going to have to probably deal with or be confronted by what uh, each of these and many others actually believed. The issue for many of these was the issue of the resurrection of Christ. This was something that was new to them. This, was, uh, this stimulated some thinking on their part. Uh, probably, if I were them and never heard anything like that, I'd be thinking, well, maybe I can get resurrected myself. So there may be some personal interest in this story of the resurrection of Christ. So, <clears throat> but Paul emphasized this. And uh, this was unusual, went against the grain of much uh, of the more popular Greek thinking. And uh, so it caused great discussion for them. The Epicureans and Stoics of verse 18 both had issues with this issue. The Stoics were pantheistic. We've given you a definition there in your notes. Pantheists uh, did not believe in a personal God. They believed in that the universe, 
the nature and that nature and God were really one and the same. Pantheism. Pan means all in the Greek. Theos, God. Everything is God. In other words, uh, the universe is God. All of the material in the universe is God, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's the was the uh, the uh, Stoic version. Pantheism. The Epicureans maintained the existence of gods, but claimed that they did not intervene in our daily life. They would be likened to, more likened to deists. Now, deists believe in one God, but they believe that they believe that God created, and then kind of left us here on our own, and that God never intervenes uh, uh, with human beings uh, ever again after that original creation. So the, uh, the uh, Epicureans were more like what we would call deists, except they were polytheists, meaning that they believed in many polytheism, many gods. Okay, so Paul was taken to Areopagus on, on page 214. He was taken to Areopagus, or it's also called Mars Hill, which was just below the Acropolis. In classical times, Mars Hill was known as the High Court of Appeals, it overlooked the agora, or the marketplace in Athens. Paul is given an opportunity before uh, uh, the, the city's dignitaries to present his case. Tell us what you think. They liked this type of stuff. You know, the, the fellows that I was with yesterday, they asked me, and they totally, absolutely listened to what I had to say. How deep it sunk in, I really don't know because that wasn't the only thing that we discussed, was my testimony and how I came to trust Christ as Savior. But I do know this, that I had a quality opportunity to bring Christ to at least two people who really didn't know the gospel as I know the gospel. Well, the message on Mars Hill, verse 22, then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Now that's pretty, pretty ingenious on Paul's part. He's looking, and, and this is what he's doing, he's looking for an opportunity to start a conversation and when we witness to people we need to try to find something that is natural that fits into our conversation that doesn't seem like we are pressing individuals to conversion at that moment you want to find, if we're talking about something, we want to see some kind, connect the dots between what we're talking about <clears throat> and something that is uh, spiritual in nature. See if you can connect the dots there. Now, when people just outright ask you how you got where you are spiritually, I mean, not many dots that have to be connected there. You just need to answer the question for sure. But there are many opportunities, many times. This is, was kind of my strategy in marriage counseling for years. <clears throat> I was always looking for a place where I could connect the dots of the person's problem with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I believe the Bible has all of the answers to all of our human problems, all of our moral problems, all of our personality problems. I believe it's in there somewhere. But the Bible's a big book. So when people come in and they kind of lay out their lives before you and their problems, if you can kind of narrow them down to understand specifically what they're asking you to help them with, that now we need to try to think, where can I connect the problem or problems with something that's in Scripture. And that may not be something that can take place absolutely immediately. For example, if a woman comes in with her husband and says, and I ask them, well, what's the problem? And they get right to the point and say, well, pastor, my husband is cheating on me. What do you think about that? 
Well, I could answer it like this. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, she truly stated her problem, and I've truly stated the scriptures, salvation scriptures, but she's looking at me like a tree full of olives and says, I don't get it. I can't connect those dots. Doesn't make sense. Your answer doesn't answer my question. And she's right. I didn't answer her question. I told her the truth. I just didn't answer her question. So what we need to do is we need to find a place to connect. And that's what Paul is doing here. Paul, hey, I saw a place where a, a, a shrine to the unknown God. Yeah, yeah, we got one right over there. Yeah, you saw it? Yeah, I saw it. I saw it. Let me tell you about him. I know who that unknown God is. Huh? You what? Yeah, I got some information on that. Can I share it with you? Go ahead. Go ahead and talk. We love to hear new stuff. Tell, tell us what you got. Because we don't have an answer to that question ourselves. I had a, many years ago, I was counseling a couple that were having marriage problems. And the woman told me this, to make a long story short. She said, Pastor Grace, we don't have spiritual problems we have marriage problems let me tell you something i didn't tell her this but if you have marriage problems you have spiritual problems spiritual problems show up in marriage problems and vice versa so but lost people or people who aren't schooled in scriptures they don't see the they don't see the connection they think spirituality and religion is something totally separate and different and distinct from marriage they don't see how they come together. By the way, both of those people are in our church 20 years later now. They understand the difference between spiritual problems and marriage problems and that there is not much difference between them, that they're essentially one and the same. But you can't say that to a person who doesn't get it. You have to help them connect the dots. Connect the dots. That's what Paul is doing, and that's the example he gives us here in chapter 17. He says, I know who the unknown God is, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, verse 23, him declare I unto you. And here goes. Now, compare what Paul says in chapter 17 with what Peter says in chapter 2, chapter 3, and what Stephen says in Acts chapter 7. You're going to see very different presentations, very different, different audiences, and different, the purpose ultimately is to bring both audience, audiences to a knowledge of Christ as Savior. That's the ultimate purpose, but you have to take two different initial set, sets of circumstances and connect the dots to get there. So Paul connects the dots with Greeks, with Gentiles, not with Jews educated in the Old Testament law, not people who crucified Christ. He says, verse 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth all, to all life and breath in all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all of the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation." That they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. And at the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man, Christ, whom he hath ordained, whereof 
he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Now, if you don't buy in to my introduction to reading this text, go back and read Acts chapter 2 and see what Peter said to the men of Israel and go back and read what Paul says to the men of Athens and see how many common truths or statements or characteristics of those two sermons you can find. Now, I'm not saying you can't find any, but you're going to find two different presentations. The goal is to get to the same place, but there are two sermons, and now we need to connect the dots to get to the goal. The goal is to bring Christ to the uttermost part of the earth. So, Paul begins his presentation by trying to find something in common or a place to connect. Beginning a conversation in a vacuum, call it cold turkey, it's very difficult. It's like the marriage thing. We have marriage problems. God so loved the world that he gave it to the people. are going, what are we talking about here? I don't get the connection. We've got to connect. You see that statue over there? That shrine to the unknown God? I know who that is. I can tell you something about him. Really? Connect. Connect. That's important. Now, what did he say? What did he say? I just wanted to kind of tear his sermon apart, and I want you to, I want you to see the different pieces, components of his message. He said men are seekers. He said men desire to worship. He said God made the world. There's cause and effect. There's design. There's intelligence. Those are important facts. When we talk about the creation of the world, causality, design, and intelligence are some of the proofs that we use in apologetics to prove that God exists. He's Lord. He's not confined or limited. He's self-existent or sufficient. He's spiritual. He's not physical. He is the giver, author, and sustainer of life. He's the creator. He hath determined. He has a will. It is his will that men seek him and connect with him. Turn the page. He's near. He's a creator. Man is made in his image. We are his offspring. We do not create God. He created us. He is superior in intelligence. He has moral expectations. Judgment is coming. He is righteous. He will judge. He is righteous and has set the standard, the standard, the standard is Jesus by that man. And he has ordered this. He has ordained this. This is his will and this is what will take place. Now you can fight that all you want. But this, you see that unknown God thing over there? Let me tell you who he is. Let me give you a list. And here we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 11, 14, 17. We have about 20 different things on this list that he shared in witnessing to them. In how many verses? Just a few short verses from verse 22 to 31. Ten verses, he shared 20 different factoids about God. Now, he's sowing seed. He's sowing seed. And there's going to be a response. Maybe nobody's will respond. His responsibility as the teacher, the preacher, is not to produce the response. We would like to see that. That's our goal, is to produce believers, worshipers of God, John 4, 23, be fishers of men, Matthew chapter 4. That's what our job is, but it's not up to me to convert anybody. It's my job to present the message clearly, accurately, biblically, and be prepared to give an answer to every man that asks of the hope that lies within me. Be prepared to be a witness or a soul winner. Well, we finish this lesson here. Page 216, the response. 
32, 33, and 34 of Acts chapter 17. 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, here are the reactions, typical reactions to the message, some mocked, and others said, we will hear thee again. They procrastinated. So Paul departed from among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed. There are three noted responses to Paul's message. And they pretty much characterize the responses to any message that is given. Whether it's a message to accept Christ as Savior, a salvation message, or it's a message on sanctification. Trying to bring people into a closer, more intimate relationship with Christ. To bring purity and holiness into the life of the believer. There are three noted or different reactions. Some people just simply say, this stuff is stupid. It's foolishness. The foolishness of preaching. Some mocked. Are you surprised? Paul the Apostle had mockers. (laughs) He knew what he was doing. He was commissioned to do what he was doing. Can you think of anybody that knew what they were doing more than what Paul the Apostle knew what he was doing and was more committed than the Apostle Paul? He didn't win them all. He didn't get, he didn't get the, a reaction from everybody that he talked to, the, a positive reaction. In fact, that's, that's proven by his many stripes and his incarcerations and his stonings and all of the different beaten with rods. Everybody didn't receive Paul's message. So implicit in Paul's message is the fact that it is impossible that excuse me that it is possible to find God it's a good message you can find God you can find peace with God Paul has pointed his listeners to the light capital L the creator the sustainer the provider of life he could be found by seeking repenting from their ignorance and turning to worship The one true God who does not dwell in temples needs nothing to be provided by human hands. The responses, some mocked, some delayed procrastination. It was me. I didn't know enough. When I was first first evangelized, when I was first the object of someone else's witness, I had had obstacles in my way. Uh, I knew something before this gentleman ever talked to me about Christianity, about Christ. I knew a lot about Jesus. Most of it was true that I knew. But I also knew some other things or was led to believe some other things that became obstacles to my faith and my belief. I was led to believe that my works would make a contribution to my salvation. I had lived 25 years of my life believing that. For somebody to walk into my life in five minutes to change my mind, that just wasn't going to happen. I had 25 years of experience believing that. So I had to hear that. I had to see that. I had to think about that. And that took for me a period of weeks in my life to come from the initial sowing of the seed to a place where I understood, truly understood what I needed to do to repent and believe in Jesus Christ, which had nothing to do with a church organization or building. I came to that place, and I believed. It's unrealistic to believe that everyone will accept the message. If you went to the internet, and you plunked in the angle scale, this is a great tool. It's been very helpful to me and to others. The angle scale basically shows us the progression from a person who knows nothing to a person trusting Christ as Savior. And what that does is it offers believers, evangelists, encouragement to see that what we are doing as evangelists, as soul winners, is our goal is to move people closer to accepting Christ as Savior. We don't go from total abject unbelief to total belief and trust in Christ as Savior, let's say zero to ten, in a five-minute conversation. It's unrealistic. I don't believe that people do that. I really don't. 
takes steps. People have to think this through, and they have to make decisions along the way. The angle scale will show you that. It's a great tool and will be encouraging. If I were you, I'd pull that up on my computer, I'd print it out, and I'd put it in my notes right here. I should have done that for you, but you can do it. You've got a computer. You can do it yourself. Our goal is to move people toward a relationship with God. We must realize that man was born to worship. God always makes the first move. God uses people to reach people. Like Paul, we ought to be troubled by the wholesale idolatry of our world. As biblical literacy declines, we must retreat to the basics to help people understand the fundamentals of belief. What must I believe to believe? It's our responsibility to move people closer. It's our responsibility to answer the tough questions. 1 Peter 3.15, one size does not fit all. People need truth, hope, and love. Those are the three things that people are looking for. They need the truth of Scripture. They need hope in eternity, and they need the love. People need to be loved. Speak the truth in love. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. There will be a wide variety of responses. Count on it. A wide variety. And conversion is not the responsibility of the evangelist. Conversion is the responsibility of the Holy Spirit of God. My responsibility is to pre be prepared to give an answer to every man that asks of the hope that lies within me. Pastor Grace, tell me about what you went through to come to Christ as Savior. That was the question that I was asked at lunch yesterday. I gave them an answer. Maybe I moved them from 10 to 9 on an angle scale or from 6 to 5 or whatever it might be. My goal is to move people closer. I gave them a pure gospel witness. I asked the Spirit of God, lead me and guide my words as I share with these people what you have done, Lord, in my life. And then know when to shut up. Don't keep pressing the issue. If they ask more questions, answer them. If it's time to change the conversation, let them move on. Move on. Acts chapter 17. Compare. Compare what Peter said in Acts chapter 2 to the Jews in Acts chapter 3 and Stephen in Acts chapter 7 and other passages along the way. Acts chapter 16 Philippian jailer, Lydia, all of those people. How about the Ethiopian eunuch, Acts chapter 8? Compare all those things and then look at the message of Acts chapter 17 on Mars Hill. There's a, several issues that are important issues that you and I need to be apologetically prepared to answer and to follow the command of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Let's stop right here. Let's take a break. We'll come back to chapter 18. We'll talk about strength training for the disciples. We'll see how God used the circumstances of life and the lives of the disciples, how he strengthened them to be great witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ.